As dawn's first light filters through the stained glass windows of medieval Europe, a world awakens, shrouded in mystery, superstition, and raw brutality. Welcome to the Middle Ages, spanning from the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century to the dawn of the Renaissance in the late 15th century. Within its embrace, great kings like Richard the Lionheart reigned, while philosophers like Thomas Aquinas sought deeper truths. Yet for the average soul, life was a relentless, often short-lived struggle. Envision for a moment the year 1348 in a bustling town square. The ominous shadow of the Black Death looms, carried by fleas on rats, claiming nearly a third of the continent's population. How would you fend off such a deadly and invisible foe without the knowledge of modern medicine? Can you hear the tolling of the church bells, marking not only the hours, but the souls taken too soon? In the words of the prolific writer Geoffrey Chaucer, life is short, the craft so long to learn. This adage holds true for the Middle Ages, where a simple infection might spell your end, where famines grip the land with skeletal fingers, and where the unpredictability of feudal lords could turn life upside down in an instant. Journey with us as we traverse this labyrinthine era, unveiling the hardships, hazards, and sheer unpredictability of life during the Middle Ages, and uncovering just why survival in this epoch was a gamble of the highest stakes. Welcome to the Diary of Julius Caesar. Alchemy of ailments, the bittersweet brew of medieval medicine. In the heart of medieval Europe, apothecaries and physicians tread the delicate line between mysticism and medicine. As the church bells tolled, calling the faithful to prayer, the practitioners of healing arts explored a world teeming with herbal concoctions, whispered incantations, and age-old remedies that danced on the edge of magic and logic. Step into a time when the world was mapped not only by land and sea, but also by the four humours, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. To the medieval physician, health was a harmonious symphony of these humours, and when discord arose, interventions like bloodletting came into play. Indeed, the art of venesection, or cutting a vein, became a fashionable solution to rebalance one's humours, with even the likes of St. Hildegard of Bingen, a 12th century Benedictine abbess, endorsing its benefits. Yet the world of medieval medicine was not limited to the mere play of lancets and scalpels. Leeches, those slimy, blood-sucking annelids, found their place in the healer's toolkit. Affectionately referred to as doctor's assistants, they were deployed to extract bad blood from a patient, in the hope of restoring vitality and vigor. The gentle undulation of a leech on the skin became a familiar sensation for many seeking relief from ailments, from fevers to joint pains. Amid this world, personalities like Avicenna, a Persian polymath, rose to prominence. His magnum opus, the canon of medicine, became the de facto textbook for European medical schools, intertwining the teachings of Aristotle and Galen into a comprehensive guide. Within its pages lay detailed notes on the pulse, its types and rhythms, shedding light on a patient's inner health. But for every shimmering insight, there existed practices that made the modern soul cringe. The lack of anesthesia, for instance, transformed surgical chambers into echo chambers of agony. The drill of a trepanation procedure designed to relieve pressure on the brain or the cut of an amputation was endured with gritted teeth, leather straps to bite on, and sometimes just a swig of potent brew. The surgeon's swift hand was often the only mercy granted. A particularly curious chapter in this era was the widespread usage of theriac. Originally formulated to counteract poisons, this compound boasted a cacophony of ingredients, including flesh from vipers. Its reputation soared to such heights that it became a panacea, championed by none other than the revered physician Galen. Theriac's legacy endured, its recipe and preparation evolving with time, making it one of the most storied medicines of antiquity and the Middle Ages. While the landscape of medieval medicine was riddled with pitfalls and peculiarities, it was also a realm of relentless curiosity. The apothecary's shelves brimmed with herbs like St. John's wort and foxglove, whispers of remedies from far-off lands like China and India wove into the tapestry, and tales of legendary waters and healing springs lured seekers from far and wide. 
Such was the age when Bath in England flourished as a hub of therapeutic baths, its waters deemed blessed by Sulis Minerva, a meld of Roman and Celtic deities. And as manuscripts penned in monasteries relayed the wisdom of ancients, fabled figures like the mythical alchemist Paracelsus dared to challenge traditional norms, introducing concepts like the doctrine of signatures. This doctrine posited that God marked plants with a sign or signature indicating their medicinal uses. A walnut, resembling a brain, was thus believed to be beneficial for the brain's health. Shadows of justice, crime and punishment in the medieval tapestry. In the cobblestone streets of medieval Europe, a tale unfolded, shrouded in both terror and intrigue. It was a time where justice wore a different face than what we recognize today. The justice system of the Middle Ages rife with its own peculiarities, was both a spectacle and a stern warning to those who dared defy the moral code of the era. Dive back to the 12th century, to the bustling streets of London. Here, one might find the infamous Tyburn Tree, a gallows where public executions became the order of the day. Whispered among the crowd, one could hear tales of the legendary outlaw Robin Hood defying the system, much to the chagrin of the Sheriff of Nottingham. The story, while romanticized in countless tales, drew its inspiration from the stark reality of the time. Centuries prior, King Athelred of England had sanctioned the blinding and mutilation of criminals. This decree, known as the Laws of Ethelred, became the precursor to the penal system's brutal treatments. As towns grew and became more populous, maintaining order became paramount. Thus, severe punishments became an instrument of deterrence and the Middle Ages was no stranger to making examples of its transgressors. While London had its Tyburn tree, France had its own infamous monument to justice, the Bastille. Originally constructed as a fortress in the 14th century, it was later used as a state prison. Here, prisoners weren't just common criminals. Over time, it became a detention center for high-profile inmates, including the ill-fated Marquis de Sade, and the enigmatic man in the iron mask. Across the waters in Italy, justice had its own distinctive flavor. The Venetian Republic, with its labyrinthine canals and masked balls, held its trials in the Doge's palace. The Bridge of Sighs, now a romantic symbol, once bore witness to the quiet laments of prisoners being led to their cells, catching their last glimpse of the city. The poet, Lord Byron, centuries later, would immortalize their sorrow with the lines, I stood in Venice on the bridge of sighs, a palace and a prison on each hand. And then there were the trials, often as much about spectacle as about justice. Take the dramatic 15th century trial of Joan of Arc. Accused of everything from cross-dressing to heresy, Joan's trial became a religious and political carnival. Her eventual martyrdom at the stake in Rouen remains one of history's most poignant reminders of the era's fierce grip on conformity and orthodoxy. Another curious method of determining guilt was the trial by ordeal. Rooted in the belief that divine intervention would save the innocent, these trials involved dangerous tasks. One might be asked to hold red-hot iron or thrust their arm into boiling water. If their wounds healed cleanly, they were deemed innocent. Otherwise, they faced the consequences of their supposed crime. In Spain, the establishment of the Inquisition in the late 15th century marked a grim chapter in the annals of justice. Led by figures like Thomas de Torquemada, this institution hunted down and punished heretics. The autos de fe, public acts of penance, became grand public spectacles, underscoring the terrifying reach of religious and state power. In an era when society sat perched on the precipice of change, with the Renaissance on the horizon, the penal system reflected both the fears and aspirations of a world in flux. Through the smoky haze of history, one can almost hear the clang of the jailer's keys, the murmurs of the crowd, and the quiet prayers of those awaiting justice, or perhaps just a touch of mercy. Whispers in the cradle, the tender agonies of medieval motherhood, in the muted glow of a medieval hearth where shadows danced and tales of old were spun, a different narrative, intimate and heart-rending, unfolded in countless homes across Europe. This was the tale of motherhood, a journey paved with profound love, 
but also marked by the ever-looming spectre of loss. Imagine the bustling streets of 13th century Paris, where tradesmen called out their wares and children's laughter echoed. Yet within the walls of timber-framed homes, scenes of silent anticipation played out. Pregnant mothers, draped in flowing gowns, awaited the moment of delivery, often surrounded by female relatives and midwives. These wise women, guardians of birthing secrets passed down through generations, were the central pillars of support during childbirth. Yet for all their knowledge of herbs and age-old techniques, the midwives of the era grappled with challenges that modern medicine has since overcome. Infections, complications during delivery, and a lack of surgical expertise often transformed what should have been moments of joy into tragic episodes. Queen Eleanor of Castile, wife of England's Edward I, was a poignant testament to these perils. Across her lifetime, she endured 16 pregnancies, but only six of her children survived into adulthood. Her tale was but one among countless others, weaving a tapestry of maternal love and loss. Children, those tiny beacons of hope and continuation, were cherished deeply. Yet the first cry of a newborn was often accompanied by whispered prayers, beseeching protection from ailments like smallpox, malnutrition, and the myriad dangers that lurked in the medieval world. The fragility of infant life was such that many children weren't named until they had weathered the treacherous initial weeks, a practice hinting at the guarded optimism of parents. Historical chronicles are replete with heart-rending anecdotes of royal and commoner alike. Take, for instance, the tale of Joan of England, the beloved daughter of King John. Barely out of infancy, she was betrothed and dispatched on a long journey to her future husband's realm. Tragically, she would never complete the voyage, succumbing to unforeseen complications on the way. The delicate dance of birth and mortality was not just the realm of mothers and infants. Fathers, often portrayed as stoic figures, bore their share of heartache. The words of King James I of Scotland, penned in his poem, The King is Queer, echo the depths of a father's sorrow. Fortune has her honey mixed with gall. Such sentiments found resonance in countless households, where the joy of a child's birth was often tempered by the weight of uncertainty. As years turned into decades and centuries, society sought solace and understanding. Religious faith often provided a balm for wounded hearts. Baptisms were hurriedly conducted, ensuring that even if a child's time on earth was brief, their souls would find eternal peace. Graveyards, those silent custodians of memories, bore witness to the scale of loss. Tiny tombstones, often adorned with cherubic motifs and tender inscriptions, dotted the landscape, each marking a life that was, however, fleeting. In a world where minstrels sang of epic battles and courtly love, the hushed lullabies hummed by a mother to her ailing child, or the silent tears of a father mourning his lost offspring, painted a different portrait of heroism. It was a heroism born not of grand deeds on battlefields, but of the quiet resilience displayed in the face of life's most profound sorrows. In the shadow of lances, the lure and lore of medieval tournaments, Amidst the tapestries of medieval Europe, where troubadours serenaded under starlit skies and courtly love flourished, the thunderous echoes of hooves and clashing steel painted a starkly contrasting scene. These were the arenas of knightly tournaments where chivalry met chaos, and tales of valour were penned in sweat, blood, and the gleam of polished armour. When the first rays of the sun kissed the meadows of northern France in the 12th century, one could catch glimpses of gallant knights, their armour glinting, preparing for the day's tourney. These early tournaments were chaotic melees, more akin to mock battles than the structured jousts of later times. Knights would clash en masse, seeking to capture and ransom their fellow combatants in a dance of combat that mirrored the brutal realities of medieval warfare. Yet, as decades turned to centuries, the face of the tournament evolved. The chaotic free-for-alls, gave way to more organized ritualistic contests, with jousting emerging as a favorite spectacle. In these events, two knights would charge at each other, separated by a wooden barrier known as the tilt, their lances aimed with precision, intending to unhorse their opponent. The sheer force of such a collision often equaled the weight of a small car crashing, turning the arena into a precarious playground. 
names like William Marshall, a knight of such renown that his exploits became legendary, carved their mark in these contests. Marshall, navigating the treacherous politics of the 12th century Plantagenet court, frequently proved his mettle in tournaments, earning both wealth and a reputation that would see him serve as regent for the young King Henry III. But the tournaments were not just about individual glory. They were social events, drawing audiences from all strata of society. Among the spectators, a maiden might toss a favor, perhaps a handkerchief or ribbon to her chosen knight, a symbol of her esteem and a talisman for his success. These gestures furthered the romantic narratives spun around tournaments, intertwining love and war in a captivating ballet. From the stands, royals and nobles watched with keen interest. Richard the Lionheart, the English king, known for his crusading zeal, was an ardent fan of these games. His presence at a tournament was a testament to its significance, lending an air of majesty to the already grand occasion. However, beneath the pomp and pageantry lurked danger, ever-present and indiscriminate. Henry II of France met his tragic end in a jousting accident in 1559, when a shard from a shattered lance pierced his eye. Such incidents underscored the deadly nature of these games, where the line between triumph and tragedy was perilously thin. Even the equipment bore witness to the inherent risks. Over time, the design of jousting lances evolved, incorporating features like the coronel, a three-pronged tip, to reduce the chance of penetration, but increase the likelihood of breaking upon impact, offering a visual spectacle. Helmets, too, grew heavier, their visors narrowing to minimize exposure. Yet, even amidst the perils, the lure of the tournament remained irresistible. Its magnetic pull was eloquently captured by Geoffroy de Charny, a 14th century knight and author who mused, you will see knights and squires, old and young, all trying to strike each other, and they would rather die than retreat. Such was the ethos that fueled these events, a blend of courage, camaraderie, and a quest for honor. Echoes of battle, the siegecraft, and skirmishes of medieval might. The wind whispered tales of heroism and tragedy as it swept through the battle-scarred landscapes of medieval Europe, a realm where the clamor of steel rang incessantly and where towering walls served as both protectors and prisons. The Middle Ages, with its rich tapestry of conquests and defenses, was an epoch where kingdoms rose and fell with the ebb and flow of wars, sieges, and endless conflicts. In 1066, a date forever etched in the annals of history, the Battle of Hastings saw William the Conqueror sail from Normandy to English shores. His triumph transformed England, but the conflict did not end at Hastings. The Norman invaders had to lay siege to many English strongholds to solidify their dominion. It was the beginning of a series of sieges that would dot the medieval landscape for centuries to come. Across the Channel, the majestic walls of Carcassonne in southern France stood defiantly. By the Albigensian Crusade's onset in the 13th century, these walls would witness the dramatic siege led by Simon de Montfort against the Cathars, a religious group deemed heretical. The siege's length and the determined resistance were immortalized in countless tales, painting a vivid picture of a city under duress, its inhabitants teetering between hope and despair. However, not all sieges were marked by months of waiting and endurance. Innovations in siege warfare, such as the trebuchet, forever changed the dynamics of battles. When Richard the Lionheart laid siege to the castle of Chalus Chabrol in 1199, it was a stray arrow from a crossbow, likely seeking out gaps in the castle's defences that fatally wounded him. His death symbolised the unpredictable nature of medieval warfare, where even kings were not immune to the randomness of fate. Then there was Constantinople, the shining gem of the East. Its massive walls, built by Emperor Theodosius II in the 5th century, had repelled numerous attacks, including those from Arab and Rus invaders. But in 1453, Sultan Mehmed II, armed with massive cannons and a fierce determination, laid siege to the Byzantine capital. After a relentless 53-day siege, the city fell, marking the end of the Byzantine Empire and paving the way for the rise of the Ottoman Turks. Speaking of the East, 
The Crusades were a series of religiously motivated campaigns where European knights sought to reclaim the Holy Land from Muslim rule. The Siege of Jerusalem in 1099 was a particularly harrowing episode. Chroniclers of the time painted grim portraits of desperation, with Raymond of Aguilas famously noting, in the temple and porch of Solomon, men rode in blood up to their knees and bridle reins. Such accounts captured the stark realities and brutalities of siege warfare during those tumultuous times. Yet amidst the vast canvas of conflicts, personal stories shimmered through. Eleanor of Aquitaine, the formidable queen of both France and England, accompanied her then-husband Louis VII during the Second Crusade. Their journey, rife with political intrigue and personal tensions, provided a glimpse into the delicate dance of power and relationships set against the backdrop of expansive military campaigns. Whispers of woe, the invisible scourge of medieval Europe. In a time when cathedrals reached skyward and minstrels sang tales of chivalry, an unseen spectre meandered through the cobblestone streets of medieval Europe. As kingdoms rose and emperors laid claim to vast territories, this phantom, born on the wings of contagion, was set to cast a shadow so profound that the very fabric of society would shudder. It was the mid-14th century when the port town of Kaffa, situated in Crimea, witnessed the opening act of this morbid drama. Siege warfare was afoot, and the attacking Mongol army, plagued by an unknown sickness, catapulted infected corpses over the city walls in what could be seen as a macabre precursor to biological warfare. From such grim beginnings, a menace would spread, carried by fleas hitching rides on black rats, travelling via merchant ships and trade routes. Named the Black Death, but known to scholars as the Bubonic Plague, its arrival was as stealthy as its effects were terrifying. In bustling marketplaces, where traders haggled and jesters entertained, whispers began. Tales of villages consumed by a swift illness, of families decimated within days, and of a dread that the world was coming to a precipitous end. Among the cobblestones of Florence, the Italian poet Giovanni Boccaccio painted a vivid image of the plague's impact in his magnum opus, The Decameron. His words echoed the despair of a society unmoored. Such terror was struck into the hearts of men and women by this calamity that brother abandoned brother, and very often the wife her husband. Yet amidst the sea of anguish, the human spirit sought solace in myriad ways. Flagellant movements gained momentum, with adherents publicly whipping themselves in penance, believing their acts would appease an angered divinity. In England, the haunting rhythm of the Ring-a-Ring-a-Roses nursery rhyme, often associated with the plague, hinted at the cultural imprints the disease would leave for generations to come. As the Black Death ebbed and flowed, claiming nearly a third of Europe's population in its initial sweep, societal structures evolved. Labour shortages following the pandemic bolstered the negotiating power of peasants, leading to events like the English Peasants' Revolt in 1381. Ironically, the very calamity that brought immense despair also sowed the seeds for societal change. But the spectre of disease wasn't limited to the bubonic plague. Leprosy, an ancient adversary, had long marked its presence in medieval Europe. Lazar houses, dedicated to the care of those afflicted, sprouted across the landscape. These institutions stood as both a testament to compassion and a grim reminder of the fragility of human existence. As the years rolled on, other diseases joined the grim procession. The sweating sickness, which struck Tudor England with ferocity, left an indelible mark on the psyche of the era. Its swift onset and deadly outcome found mention in the writings of Thomas More and Desiderius Erasmus, both of whom navigated the treacherous waters of this new ailment. In the corridors of time, where knights and serfs, kings and paupers all tread, the invisible foes of disease claimed a place of dark distinction. The tales of woe they wrought, the societal upheavals they spurred, and the indomitable spirit of humanity they tested, all converge into a narrative as profound as any war or renaissance. Chains of Earth, the silenced ballad of the medieval serf. In the sprawling tapestry of medieval Europe, where knights galloped on armoured steeds and minstrels serenaded moonlit courts, there lay a less illustrious narrative, one of muted voices and tethered hopes. 
This was the tale of the serf, forever bound to the loamy embrace of the land, beneath the watchful eyes of their feudal lords. Journey to the verdant fields of 12th century England, where the sun's rays kissed the brow of the laboring serf. Each droplet of sweat that trickled down their forehead wasn't just the mark of physical toil, but was also emblematic of a life tethered by invisible chains. The serf, unlike the free peasant, was not merely a worker of the land, but was in many respects a part of the land itself. The very soil they tilled, sowed and reaped was the same soil that anchored them in a cycle of perennial servitude. The dominion of the local lord was not just over tracts of earth, but extended over the very lives and destinies of those who inhabited it. A serf's nuptials required the lord's consent, and their children, like fledglings never destined to fly far from the nest, inherited the yoke of serfdom. Historical records echo with tales of lords exercising the droit de seigneur, a controversial and debated right alleged to permit a lord to spend the first night with a serf's bride. Within the stone walls of the manor house, life thrummed to a different beat. Here the lord, often a vassal to a more powerful noble or monarch, played the dual role of protector and benefactor. In return for the serf's unyielding labor, he provided them with parcels of land to cultivate, protection from marauding bands or neighboring feuds, and a semblance of justice in his court. Yet, the scales were often imbalanced. The famous Domesday Book, commissioned by William the Conqueror in 1086, chronicled the vast lands and resources of England, cataloguing serfs as assets, akin to livestock or chattel. Their worth was measured not by their dreams or desires, but by their capacity to toil and yield. From the heart of France emanated tales of serfs like Pierre, who, in a bid for freedom, fled to burgeoning towns, believing urban legends that a year and a day in the city could break the shackles of serfdom. Some found new beginnings, while others discovered that the shadow of their past loomed large, even in the labyrinthine alleys of medieval metropolises. Sprinkled amidst these chronicles were moments of muted rebellion and quiet resilience. The ballads of wandering minstrels, while often singing praises of valiant knights, sometimes carried the undertones of serfdom's sorrows. One could hear whispers of emancipations, where entire villages negotiated charters of freedoms, buying their way out of bondage. Such tales, though sparse, offered glimmers of hope in an otherwise overcast horizon. The voices of serfs, though stifled by the weight of feudal chains, found resonance in later epochs. Historians like Mark Bloch delved into the annals of serfdom, seeking to amplify their narratives and place them center stage in the grand theater of history. In the heart of medieval Europe, as empires rose and cathedrals touched the heavens, the serf, with hands calloused and spirit unyielding, carved out a life between hope and despair. Theirs was a ballad of earth and endurance, a song of silent strength that echoed through the corridors of time, reminding future generations of the price of freedom and the indomitable will of the human spirit. Echoes of faith, the fiery trials of the medieval soul. Amidst the sprawling landscapes of medieval Europe, where cathedral spires pierced the heavens and Gregorian chants resonated in sacred corridors, the human soul found itself enmeshed in a relentless struggle. It was an age where faith was both shield and sword, illuminating the path for many while casting shadows upon others. The dawn of the 12th century bore witness to the shifting contours of Christendom. As theological debates raged within cloistered halls, the streets outside brimmed with whispers of heresy. Cathars in southern France, with their dualistic beliefs contrasting starkly with orthodox Christianity, found themselves at the storm's epicenter. Albi, a quaint town drenched in Occitan culture, became synonymous with the Cathar heresy, eventually giving rise to the term Albigensian. Their beliefs, viewed as a challenge to the very foundation of the church, ignited the flames of the Albigensian crusade, where towns like Béziers were consumed in both metaphorical and literal fires. Yet the Cathars were not alone in their ordeal. Across the Channel, in the verdant Isles of England, tales of persecution painted the chronicles. A prominent figure of such narrative was Marjorie Kemper, a mystic and visionary. In her book, 
Marjorie spoke of divine revelations, her fervent tears, and impassioned pilgrimages. Yet, her unorthodox expressions of piety often landed her in the crosshairs of suspicion as she danced on the precipice of heresy. Venturing eastward, the tales took on a different hue. In the heart of Iberia, where the echoes of the Reconquista still lingered, the harmony of coexistence began to wane. Jews, who had once thrived under Islamic rule, found their fortunes overturned. In cities like Toledo and Granada, the spectre of the Inquisition loomed, where the infamous auto da fe saw many a soul consumed by fire, their only crime being a faith deemed alien to the orthodoxy. While Europe grappled with internal theological rifts, the call of distant lands echoed in the chambers of power. Pope Urban II, standing upon the pulpit in Clermont in 1095, ignited the passion of thousands with his call for the First Crusade. He spoke of the Holy Land, of Jerusalem's hallowed streets, now under the Seljuk yoke. His words, Deus vult, God wills it, became the clarion call for a generation of knights and peasants alike. Yet, as the Crusaders marched through Byzantine lands, places like Constantinople bore witness to the darker undertones of this holy endeavor, as friend and foe became indistinguishable in the throes of ambition and zealotry. Among the myriad voices of this era, one stands out, not for his sword, but for his pen. Peter Abelard, the famed philosopher-theologian of Paris, ventured where few dared, questioning doctrines and challenging established norms. His affair with Heloise became the stuff of legend, but it was his treatise, Siquet Non, that truly stirred the waters. Juxtaposing contradictory theological sources, Abelard did not offer resolutions, but instead invited readers to critical reflection. The establishment, however, viewed his endeavors with trepidation, leading to his works being branded heretical at the Council of Sens. Storms from the north, the thunderous echoes of Viking invaders, the chill of a northern wind carries tales as old as time, of fierce warriors and relentless explorers who dared to voyage into the great unknown. The Vikings, whose name in Old Norse, Vikinger, signified a pirate or raider, were not merely plunderers, but bearers of a cultural tidal wave that reshaped the medieval tapestry of Europe. In the latter part of the 8th century, as monastic bells chimed harmoniously across the serene landscapes of Northumbria in England, a shadow loomed on the horizon. The year 793 AD bore witness to an event that would send shockwaves across Christendom. The holy island of Lindisfarne, a beacon of Christian piety, was laid siege to by seafaring Norsemen. Monks, who once transcribed holy scriptures and illuminated manuscripts, were now faced with the grim spectacle of Viking aggression. This was no mere raid, it was a clarion call of an age of exploration and expansion. While Lindisfarne is etched in historical annals as a symbol of these incursions, it was but one chapter in a sprawling saga. The shores of Ireland, with its verdant beauty, were no strangers to the Viking prowess. Dublin, today a bustling capital, owes its genesis to these Norse settlers. Similarly, the enchanting waterways of France whispered tales of another Viking legend, Rollo, who would later lay the foundations of the Duchy of Normandy, forever altering the course of English history. Venturing further south, even the formidable walls of Paris couldn't deter these audacious explorers. In 845 AD, the Norse chieftain Ragnar Lodbrok, as legend has it, sailed up the Seine. King Charles the Bald of West Francia, a descendant of the mighty Charlemagne, could only watch in trepidation as Ragnar's men besieged his prized city. The Viking raider, as shrewd as he was fierce, finally departed, but only after his coffers were filled with 7,000 pounds of silver as tribute. But the Viking narrative was not merely of plunder and conquest. In their longships, carved intricately with tales of gods and monsters, these Norsemen sailed to the corners of the known world. They braved the icy expanse of Greenland, where Eric the Red established settlements, and ventured even further to the shores of Vinland, in what we today recognize as North America. Their reach was not confined to the West. The Byzantine Empire's Varangian Guard, elite soldiers in service to the Emperor in Constantinople, boasted many a Norse warrior in its ranks. 
While their martial prowess was undeniable, what truly distinguished the Vikings was their spirit of curiosity and resilience. Their sagas, oral narratives, passed down generations, captured not just their heroic deeds, but their human essence. The saga of Egil Skallagrimsson, for instance, paints the portrait of a warrior poet whose verses were as poignant as his sword strokes were fierce. And then there was the enigmatic runic alphabet, through which they etched their tales on stones, forever immortalizing their journeys. Amidst this tapestry of adventure and conflict, one cannot help but reflect on a curious artifact, the Lewis Chessman, discovered in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. These intricately carved walrus ivory pieces with their stoic kings, knights and berserkers offer a glimpse into the Viking psyche. Were they mere game pieces, or did they, in their silent elegance, capture the essence of an age of exploration, where every move was a dance between destiny and free will? Shadows and whispers, the eerie dance of medieval superstitions and witch hunts, the murmur of the winds, the croak of a raven, or the hoot of an owl during a full moon night, such seemingly innocuous occurrences took on a more sinister and prophetic hue during the Middle Ages. An era of limited scientific understanding, the medieval world was a canvas painted with the rich, often dark, hues of superstitions. On this canvas, perhaps no imagery was as terrifying or captivating as the supposed spectre of witchcraft. In the dimly lit chambers of homes across Europe, Tales would be shared of malevolent witches riding broomsticks across the moonlit sky or concocting malefic potions to bewitch or harm the unsuspecting. Such stories, rather than being mere nighttime fables, had tangible consequences for those branded as the antagonists. The mere whisper of the word witch was often enough to spark paranoia. This was not simply a product of vivid imaginations, but was compounded by the church's view on the matter. The infamous treatise Malleus Maleficarum, or The Hammer of Witches, penned in 1487 by the clergyman Heinrich Kramer, detailed the methods to identify, interrogate, and execute supposed witches. This tome, serving almost as a guidebook, stoked the fires of the witch hunts that would sweep Europe in the ensuing years. Francis Joan of Arc, a symbol of hope and resistance against English occupation, was accused of heresy and witchcraft her close relationship with the divine deemed suspicious. Despite her victories for France, the young visionary found herself tied to a stake in Rouen in 1431, her claims of prophetic visions and conversations with saints leading to her fiery demise. In the British Isles, fear of the supernatural was just as palpable. Scotland, with its rugged highlands and misty glens, was a particularly fertile ground for tales of the arcane. King James VI's obsession with the dark arts culminated in the North Berwick witch trials of the 1590s. After facing storms while sailing back from Denmark with his queen, James was convinced that malevolent witches were attempting to drown him. The resulting investigations saw over a hundred people accused, with many facing torture and grim ends. Yet it wasn't just the elite or royals who were ensnared in this web of superstition. In the rolling countryside of Germany, an old herbalist providing remedies might suddenly find herself accused of brewing not cures, but curses. A midwife, after a series of unsuccessful childbirths in a village, could be branded a witch, believed to be siphoning away the souls of the newborns. Often, these hunts and trials had undercurrents of societal and political machinations. The accused were frequently outsiders, those who did not fit neatly into the societal mold or individuals with whom there were old scores to settle. Accusations of witchcraft became convenient tools to marginalize and remove threats. This vortex of paranoia even consumed intellectual circles. The renowned philosopher Johann Weyer in the 16th century dared to challenge the prevailing notions. He posited that many accused of witchcraft were suffering from mental illnesses and should be cared for by physicians rather than persecuted. His progressive views, however, were met with backlash from contemporaries who viewed them as heretical. Harvests, hunger and hope, the gastronomic gamble of medieval meals. Amid the tapestries of medieval tales woven with chivalry and conquests, the humbler stories of daily sustenance often remain overshadowed. 
Yet every bowl of pottage, slice of coarse bread and jug of ale, tells a tale of a people constantly dancing on the delicate precipice of nourishment and need. The medieval kitchens with their crackling fires and simmering pots were a haven, especially in the unforgiving winters. But beneath the warmth and the alluring aroma, there lay a gamble, a game of chance with every bite and every sip. Without the conveniences of modern preservation, the food on the medieval table was often a double-edged sword, promising nourishment on one hand and potential sickness on the other. The art of food preservation was a blend of tradition and innovation. Techniques like salting, drying and fermenting were passed down through generations. Yet even these age-old methods were no match for the mercurial European climate. The hot summers could spoil stocks of grain, turning them mouldy and giving rise to ergotism, a deadly condition popularly termed as St. Anthony's fire. This condition, a result of consuming fungi-infected rye bread, led to hallucinations, painful seizures, and in many instances, gangrene. If the threat of diseases wasn't daunting enough, the spectre of famine loomed large, casting shadows of despair. The years 1315 to 1317, known as the Great Famine, saw relentless rains ruin crops across northern Europe. Rivers flooded, cattle drowned, and granaries turned into rotting cesspools. Chronicles of the time, like those by the Welsh priest Adam of Usk, recount tales of desperation where families abandoned their homes, and people resorted to consuming horse meat, dogs, cats, and, in the darkest of times, even fellow humans. Yet even in abundance, not all was merry. The flavors that graced the tables of medieval Europe were a curious blend. A favorite treat was the stockfish dried cod from the far northern seas, often beaten to tenderize before cooking. With no access to tomatoes, a new world discovery, the sauces were thickened with bread and seasoned heavily with spices like pepper, cloves, and cinnamon, not just for taste, but in the hope of masking any onset of spoilage. Wine, considered safer than water due to the fermentation process, was consumed in abundance, though often watered down. However, without knowledge of pasteurization, milk was a risky drink, leading to a preference for cheese and butter. Royal feasts, though grand in their spread, weren't without risks either. King John of England, the very monarch who signed the Magna Carta, is believed to have died in 1216 from dysentery, possibly contracted from feasting on a surfeit of peaches and new cider. Medieval markets, bustling with vendors peddling their produce, were a sensory overload. The lack of oversight meant adulteration was rampant. The baker might mix in chalk or sawdust to stretch the flour supplies, while the alewife could be diluting the ale with dubious water sources. Indeed, these practices gave birth to the Assize of Bread and Ale in England, a set of regulations stipulating the price, weight and quality of these staple items. Despite the perils, there was an indomitable spirit, a resilience that defined the medieval populace. They embraced their humble lentils, beans and grains, making the most of what the seasons granted them. The monastic gardens flourished with herbs, not just for healing, but also for adding zest to meals. Rivers of Rue, the sullied streets of medieval metropolises, in the dim alleyways and bustling marketplaces of medieval European cities, a mosaic of human enterprise came alive, punctuated by the calls of merchants, the clatter of horse hooves, and the peals of church bells. Yet, underneath this tapestry of life, there flowed unseen rivers, rivulets of refuse, remnants of repasts, and reminders of the rudimentary understanding of sanitation of the time. The idea of a clean, cobbled street would have been as fantastical to a medieval denizen as a flying carriage. The streets of cities like London, Paris or Rome, though vibrant hubs of commerce and culture, bore little resemblance to their modern counterparts. Instead of orderly lanes and byways, many medieval streets were muddied morasses where waste of all kinds freely mingled. A notable curiosity of this era was the chamber pot, a nightly companion for many. Come dawn, its contents would often find their way out of windows with a customary cry of Gardez low, watch out for the water, a precursor to the modern day heads up. This unsavory morning ritual, especially in crowded cities, meant that pedestrians needed more than just a keen sense of direction. 
agility and quick reflexes were just as crucial. While some medieval cities did boast rudimentary drainage systems, they were often poorly maintained and inefficient. The Cloaca Maxima, the grand sewer of ancient Rome by the time of the Middle Ages, had become a choked shadow of its former self. Similarly, in London, the Fleet River, which once was a navigable waterway, had turned into a sluggish stream of sludge due to the indiscriminate dumping of waste. But why this general apathy towards cleanliness? One reason was the prevailing medical theories of the time. Grounded in the humoral theory, where the balance of the body's four humors determined health, environmental cleanliness was not directly linked to personal health. Thus, bathing, which was a communal and social activity in Roman times, dwindled in popularity. By the time of the plague of 1665, a well-meaning pamphlet advised Londoners to forsake public baths, lest by the use of the hothouse the humours be rarefied, the pores of the body opened, and so rendered more susceptible of the contagion. Historical figures weren't immune to these sanitation challenges either. The grand palaces of monarchs with their gilded chambers and tapestried halls had their own issues. Versailles, the magnificent seat of the French monarchy, had no toilets for its thousands of courtiers. Instead, hallways and stairwells often bore the brunt of urgent necessities. In an attempt to combat the odours of the urban environment, a profusion of perfumes, pomanders and scented handkerchiefs became indispensable accessories for the elite. Queen Elizabeth I of England, famed for her alabaster complexion, was said to bathe once a month, a frequency considered excessive by many of her contemporaries. Yet, amidst this olfactory onslaught, the seeds of change were sprouting. Visionaries like John of Salisbury in the 12th century criticized the filth of cities, likening Paris to a dung heap. By the 16th century, urban regulations began emerging, dictating where and how waste could be disposed of, hinting at an evolving understanding of urban hygiene. Whispers and wagon tracks, the slow dance of distance in the Middle Ages. In the grand tapestry of time, the Middle Ages unfurl as a chiaroscuro of events, moments of enlightenment interwoven with shadows of limitation. One of the more muted hues of this epoch was the challenge of mobility and communication. A journey that modernity might dismiss as a simple day's drive in medieval times could transmute into a perilous pilgrimage. The very landscape seemed to conspire against the traveller. Roads, where they existed, were frequently no more than dirt paths that morphed into quagmires with the slightest drizzle. The Roman road network, once the arteries of a vast empire, languished in disrepair, often reclaimed by nature or rendered useless by years of neglect. Yet, the condition of the roads was but one challenge. Highways and byways were often haunted by the spectre of outlaws. The legendary Robin Hood, lurking in the verdant depths of Sherwood Forest, might be celebrated in song and story, but lesser-known bandits and brigands were the dread of many a wayfarer. An admonishment, beware the highwayman, was not just the stuff of fireside tales, but a very real caution for those venturing beyond familiar confines. These adversities made the prospect of travel daunting, so much so that, for many, life was circumscribed by the horizons of their birthplace. A village, a town, perhaps a nearby city, these were the boundaries of their world. Journeying was often the privilege or duty of merchants, pilgrims, messengers and soldiers. Such was the gravity of the situation that in 12th century England, Henry II introduced a legal reform known as the Assize of Arms, ensuring that roads would be kept clear of obstacles for the safety and swiftness of royal messengers. Yet, if the physical journey was fraught with challenges, the ethereal realm of communication was no less labyrinthine. The notion of instant messaging would have seemed as outlandish as a dragon's flight. Instead, messages were entrusted to couriers who bore them across mountains, valleys, forests and plains. News travelled only as fast as the swiftest horse or ship. The renowned Islamic scholar Ibn Battuta's travels spanned three decades and covered much of the known world but news of his exploits trickled back to his homeland in fragments and tales, whispered in caravanserais and marketplaces. Historical figures were well aware of these constraints. 
Richard the Lionheart's capture near Vienna in 1192 remained unknown to his subjects in England for many weeks. Imagine the modern world awaiting news for such a duration, adrift in a sea of uncertainty, speculation, and rumor. Sometimes, the means of communication took unusual forms. In Scandinavian cultures, rune stones were erected, bearing inscriptions that often served as both memorials and messages, conveying tales of distant voyages or commemorating notable events. Though static, these stones whispered stories to those who paused to read them. Similarly, in the Byzantine Empire, an intricate system of beacons and watchtowers stretched from the frontier regions back to the capital, Constantinople. These signaled incursions or threats, using a coded language of smoke and fire, ensuring that news of border skirmishes reached the emperor in a matter of hours rather than days. In the dim glow of tallow and tides, the austere aesthetics of medieval living, long before the buzz of electricity or the hum of central heating, the world thrummed to a different rhythm. It was a world where the golden orb of the sun dictated the routines of daily life, and the silvery glow of the moon whispered stories in the hushed darkness. The Middle Ages, for all its tales of grandeur and chivalry, was also a time where the simple conveniences we take for granted remained far beyond the grasp of even the most opulent monarch. Each daybreak, across the tapestry of Europe, villagers would rise not to the blare of an alarm, but to the first light filtering through wooden shutters or the crow of the resident rooster. Homes, from the simplest hut to the grandest castle, remained devoid of the miracle of electric bulbs. Instead, illumination came from flickering tallow candles or oil lamps, their dim glow casting long shadows that danced with the imagination, giving birth to tales of ghosts, goblins, and other nocturnal creatures. The renowned philosopher Thomas Aquinas, penning his prolific works, would have relied on such dim and smoky illumination, bending close to his parchment, straining his eyes in the meager light. It's said that King Edward III of England, keen on reading, ordered 50 pounds of wax for candles each winter to indulge in his pastime during the long nights. But lighting was just one fragment of the mosaic of medieval life. As the biting winter chills settled in, there was no thermostat to turn up or electric blanket to snuggle under. Instead, warmth emanated from great hearths or smaller fireplaces, around which families huddled, sharing tales and songs. In places like Iceland, with its sparse timber resources, turf and peat became the fuels of choice, the pungent smoke from which was a familiar scent in homes. Castles, for all their stone grandeur, could become icy mausoleums, prompting residents to wear layers of fur and gather in the smaller chambers where heat was easier to retain. Water, that vital elixir of life, was an adventure in itself. Without taps gushing forth clean and filtered water, fetching it was a daily ritual. Rivers, streams or community wells became focal points of settlement and socialization. Maid Marian, had she been a real figure, would perhaps have exchanged pleasantries with neighbors at the village well, the vessel on her shoulder a testament to the labor of the task. Historical records speak of London's great conduit, a medieval water supply system that brought in fresh water from springs outside the city, a testament to the ingenuity of the age. Yet, for all the toils and troubles, this was an era that cultivated a profound appreciation for the simple pleasures. The soft glow of a candle became a sanctuary of serenity, its gentle flicker a balm for the weary soul. The warmth of a fireplace, around which families congregated, fostered bonds of kinship and camaraderie that many a modern individual, ensconced in digital screens, might envy. Every drop of water, hard-earned from wells or streams, was a liquid gem, teaching gratitude with each sip. Perhaps Geoffrey Chaucer, in his Canterbury Tales, paints the most vivid picture of this epoch. His pilgrims, from the night to the miller, journeyed long distances, braving the elements without the comfort of heated carriages or LED lanterns, drawing warmth from shared stories and the camaraderie of fellow travellers. As the shadows of yesteryears draw to a close, we're reminded of the hardiness of our ancestors, the very sinew and spirit that crafted history. The Middle Ages, a tapestry of valour and vicissitudes, 
is not just a chapter from our textbooks, but a testament to human endurance. Would we, accustomed to our modern comforts, have thrived in an epoch without electricity, antibiotics, or Netflix? Sir Thomas More once remarked, the times are never so bad, but that a good man can live in them. But the question remains, would we have been able to stand tall amidst the tumult of medieval times? Reflect on that as we bid adieu to a world that was as challenging as it was charismatic. Until our next historical journey, fare thee well.